attention, all personnel. Incoming podcast. This is MASH Matters. We're back. MASH Matters. And, uh, you know, it does. It matters. It matters a lot. We hear from people all over the country and all over the world telling us that MASH matters. It never ceases to amaze me, the reaction and the response that we get from people around the world saying, hey, thanks for doing this. This is really fun. I've had so many wonderful experiences with MASH. I used to watch it with my mother and my father. Ryan, really, it just never ceases to amaze me anyway. I, and again, I, I've said this before, but I'm very touched by what people write and say, not only about us, but about my participation on the show and what they liked yeah. about me or, <laughs> or didn't like about me. But uh, <laughs> it, it's all it's all rather sweet. So you can write in and say all the wonderful things that you'd like to about me. It's perfectly OK with me. Any <laughs> Even in any language, it doesn't matter. That's right. We'll run it through Google Translate and figure it out. Yeah. Absolutely. MASH Matters is a podcast that you and I have been doing here for a little while. And I think today it matters more than ever because we have Mm -hmm. a wonderful guest star joining us today. And Jeff, I would love for you to introduce us to your friend. Uh, and then I'll introduce you to the guest because that's probably more important. <laughs> anyway. Oh, ouch. <laughs> okay. Come right back. We're here all week, ladies and gentlemen. Have the meal. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just going to read a little something and then we'll, we'll do this. Here we go. She was born in Oahu, Hawaii. Before becoming an actress, she moved from Hawaii to San Francisco to pursue a career in art. She married David and moved to Los Angeles to try acting. Why she would do that, I don't know, but I'm glad she did. Other than MASH, she has had roles in guest spots and other television shows and movies such as Clue. She is a graduate of Kalani High School in Honolulu, still works as an actress, uh, as well as a watercolor artist who paints and exhibits under her married name. She has two children, daughter Nalani and son William. And she's been a friend of mine since 1974. Four, I think, maybe even earlier than that. And uh, I'm very, very, very happy to be able to introduce one of the best people in the world and a great, great, great human being, a great friend of mine, Kelly Nakahara, better known to everybody who's listening to this podcast as Nurse Kelly. Kelly, welcome to MASH Matters. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Kelly. Hi. <laughs> you guys are wild. It's so fun. This is so great. Is this what you said, said you would get me into? Oh, my God. Okay. You're stuck now. You're in here with yeah. us. You can't get out. We are so thrilled to have you, Kelly. We've been we've been wanting to talk to you for so, so long. And finally, we've been able to connect. Uh, this is just an absolute dream. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. And it's so exciting. And I can't believe that I'm on a podcast because I have four grandsons over the age of 17. Now, they had to get online the other night and explain to me what a podcast was. So (laughs) (laughs) I actually have been doing this a number of months. I still don't know what a podcast is. I'm still waiting to figure it out. I don't know know, what it is. Where do you get the pods? Where Where are you? Where are you? I don't get it. All right. So, so this is, is very, very weird to me, but, but a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. And I'm going to tell you right now, uh, Kelly, there are going to be so many people who are going to be thrilled and overjoyed to, uh, hear us talk to you on this podcast. Because if, if you don't mind, before we get into your career, I would love to start with a question that we received from a listener, uh, actually a while back. And I've been holding on to this until I knew we were going to be able to connect with you. Jeff Hagers, uh, listener Jeff Hagers, he wrote in a while back saying, hello, I'm enjoying the podcast. Thanks for doing it. One of my favorite episodes is Hey, Look Me Over, which featured Kelly Nakahara's wonderful character, Nurse Kelly. He says, Jeff, from various pages on the web, it appears that you and she have remained friends since MASH ended. I know she's fighting health issues. Can you share any updates? Thanks in advance, Jeff Hagers. Oh. So on behalf of Jeff and the entire MASH community who has been thinking and, and praying and sending well wishes to you, do you mind sharing an update on uh, how you're doing health wise? Not at all. Not at all. No problem whatsoever. I'm, I'm doing very well. I opened myself up to the very at the very beginning when I was first diagnosed. It's been, it's been about a year. 
I talked to my family and I said, look, I really absorb good feelings and good vibes. And I really thought a lot about this, this disease. And I said, in the past, you didn't talk to people. They didn't talk to you about it. It was you wanted to keep their privacy. And they didn't want to burden you. But what it ended up being was I realized I needed every ounce of support I could get. This was going to be a fight that we were going to do. And it wasn't just about my family. It was my friends. It was my neighbors. It was anybody I could get, come close to that I could say to them when they said, how are you? I could tell them the truth. And every time I did that, and this was a lot of it was Jeff's advice because Jeff has has been really, really helpful to me and a, a huge support to me. And he's a great buddy of mine from way earlier, much sooner than 1973. He's got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was only 11 when yeah, we well, met. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what you'd like to say. But the, the thing is, is, every time I was able to talk to someone else about it, and they told me about their family's experience or friends, it gave me tremendous amount of strength to be able to deal with the stress of getting through the really nitty gritty hard parts of chemo and operations and things like that. So having that support was like having all those people in the room lifting me. I've heard from hundreds and hundreds of people to check up, see how I'm doing. Every single member of the cast, producers, writers, a couple who I haven't heard for years because I do keep in touch with the rest. So it's been a tremendous support. I feel completely lifted by it all. So if there are people out there who are supporting me or anybody else, I say bring it on. It's time to open the doors and it's time for us to all do this together because this is how I managed it. And I'm in remission. Yay! Yay. Last week they told me I was in remission and so... I'm feeling really, really much stronger, uh -huh. and I'm really grateful to be able to do this with you guys. And thank you for letting me talk to you about the about the cancer and being open about it. And my my take on that it's a good thing being open. Wow, I think that's really brave to be able to talk about it. So you know, like you say, why hide it? You can't hide it anyway. Why hide it and let people into it? Let people be able to relate to you with love and and the best way they can. And that's that's so uh, rewarding. I'm I'm so happy that you did. And actually, hiding it gives the impression that you've done something wrong mm -hmm. and you can't talk about it, right? Or it's shameful. And all of those things are not true. And so opening up brings the sunshine in for me and just love so much love. It's been overwhelming to try and wrap my head around the fact that there's that that many people out there that are so selfless that they would spend their time of the day at all to talk to me, to write to me, to encourage me. It's been really amazing. Amazing, you guys. Well, if you're going to be overwhelmed, being overwhelmed by love is a pretty good way to do it. Yeah. Nicely said. Well, thank you. I'm done. I'm out. Ryan, you're good. <laughs> I'll just let you guys talk for the next hour. So go get your ice cream. You you, you did well. So Kelly. Yes, Jeffy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I met you. Uh, I the first day that I was at Mash, and I talked about this in the podcast. The first day I was there, I was at the ranch, and it was an, a miserable, horrible experience. <laughs> I got there. I I was not used to movie sets or TV sets or anything. I was used to nightclubs and staying up late and you know going to bed at one o'clock and in, in yeah. the afternoon. And so it wasn't it wasn't part of my thing. So when I got to that set, and you're out there at the ranch. Yeah. And it's freezing cold. It's freezing cold. It's five in the morning. It's horrible. Horrible. It was horrible. And that guy, George Bachelor, the assistant director. <laughs> oh, assistant, George assistant. George. Remember George Bachelor? He yes. was a funny little guy with a goatee. Cremudgeon. Cremudgeon. Screaming and yes. yelling. Oh, 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 put your clothes on. Oh. I loved him. So he was a curmudgeon, yeah. but he was kind of in charge of various things. And he would tell everybody what to do and where to go. And he, I walked in and he starts yelling at me to go put my pants on and go in there and get. And you're going in this awful little hut uh, in the freezing cold. And I got to take my clothes off and put all this dirty green clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, remember the uh, the bee smoke where they. Oh, my God. You spraying that smoke, smoke around. So we didn't have yes. bees. Do you remember that it used to get so hot? They'd have these water tanks, huge water tanks to spray the dirt down in the compound to keep it from flying up when the wind came so that when they were shooting 
uh, all the dirt was tamped down. And we used to climb into the water tanks, not fully in, but halfway in and splash ourselves, get ourselves soaking <laughs> wet because it was so hot. <laughs> besides taking the salt pills, because we filmed winter <laughs> in the summer. Do you remember filming winter in the summer and filming summertime scenes in the winter? Yeah. So when you got there, it was winter and it was freezing and they told you to put on nothing, <laughs> no, no jackets, no anything. But, you know, I loved it. <laughs> I loved the bee smoke. I loved the fact that everybody had to spray down to get wet. I loved George Bachelor. And he loved me. Jeff, I was his favorite. Oh, oh. <laughs> this is this is a scoop. He loved me, Jeff. I don't know what you did, but he really <laughs> loved me. <laughs> he didn't love me. <laughs> you know I loved you. Not me, oh, not so much. But you were you when you came, Jeff, you were instantly right. You were just right. It was just it was like, who is that? Wait a minute. Isn't he always here? <laughs> Hasn't he been here for a <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> you fit right. that, you, that's, that's kind of the nicest thing I think I've ever heard. You fit right in. Yeah. And the interesting part about what all of us were, you were stuck in remote places for hours and hours and hours on and day after day. And as luck would have it and the and the clouds opened up and the sky opened up and the spirits were with us, we adored each other and we thought we were all so freaking funny. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't one of us that didn't think we were hilarious. It was just and I could I remember Alan falling over on the on the ground with Mike Farrell when you said something. I don't it was just we were just talking. It wasn't even in a scene. And we were all on the ground and for 15 minutes. They couldn't get us to stop laughing because of something you said or did. It was it, and that happened all the time. And it, <laughs> we really were thrown into a compound just as though we were in the army in this remote place. And you had to you had to sink or swim. Yep. And you better enjoy the people that you're with. Yeah, I love the one you're with. <laughs> <laughs> so in the war, that was what it was like. And that's what people had to do. And they become very, very close. And to this day, I just got a, a, a note from Alan the uh, day before yesterday, I think it was. The thing is, is that we've never really gotten out of caring with each other. I think, you know, going back to the fact that you're saying, you know, when I showed up, you just said it. Yeah, this guy is right. It was an amazing experience to suddenly be part of a family and and have that a real sense of comfort and home. I've never experienced that anywhere else. And I've done other stuff and been in other TV shows and some movies and stuff. Never have I walked on a set and felt that under any circumstances. And when I did that, when I showed up on the match the second day, I didn't know whether I'd ever go there again. But yeah. the second day, really, all of a sudden, I, I did feel that I was home and yeah. everybody. And, yeah, I think I've said this to you. You you were really, really, really kind of responsible in some way to of keeping me there. Yes. Because um, when we when we became friends, I, I you were kind of a mentor. <laughs> you sort of. <laughs> Uh, let me know who was who and what was happening and yeah. how it all kind of worked because I didn't know. And yeah. uh, you were very, very kind to do that. So I thank you very much. And Well, well, you're welcome. Now get off the phone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have we have a friend. Jeff and I have a friend, G.W. Bailey. Mm -hmm. Let's see. What was his part? Jeff, he played Rizzo. Sergeant Rizzo, yes. Sergeant Rizzo. That, what you see is what you get. That's GW. <laughs> he, he would say, ask the queen. Yep. Because she'll tell you where to go and who to go. And, you know, I accepted the role. <laughs> well, you did. Yeah, you did. You did it, it so nice beautifully. <laughs> yeah, it was so elegant the no. way you did it. And uh, yeah, it was. We just all knew where to go and who to ask if something was going on. <laughs> we needed to know. For me, it was. So exciting because we had such everybody was such an incredible talent. I I never could sit down. I remember I would 
hang out with Larry Gelbart, hang out with the writers, absorb everything they were saying to each other. I, I It was so fascinating to me that I hung out with everybody all the time. I never really just went away and read a book. Yeah. And you didn't either, Jeff. Nope. No, you didn't either. There was always something very interesting going on <laughs> at, at one point. You could always find somewhere to go. Oh, my God. All you had to do was get a cup of coffee and sit, sit next to McLean Stevenson. <laughs> Your day was made because, oh, my God, he put on a show every single minute. He was the funniest man ever. Yeah, he was. And And Harry Morgan would do the same thing. We would be in the operating room and Harry Morgan would be clipping us all to each other from the behind. And then we would walk away to do our scene and we'd get stuck because they were they were forceps and clips hanging from the backs of our. Do <laughs> uh, you remember that? Dave? Do you remember David Ogden stars putting chicken guts into the into the dummies? So, so when they operate. So when he would pull things out, all of a sudden we'd look up and there was just goop coming out of the things. What do you think the nurses thought? Oh, my God. And we couldn't squeal or scream. It was hilarious. And that was constant. What what a wonderful way to spend your day. Yeah, no kidding. I would love to go back to the beginning and hear the story of what road led to MASH for you. Well, mine is a really, really weird one. Because I was hired back in the day, it was 1972 or 71. I was a bank teller and I was terrible. <laughs> okay, I was in the sent to the loan department and I was supposed to check off people's loans to make sure they got all of their things together. And I would put people in that had iffy things on because I thought they deserved another review because I thought that they were really nice people. So I was probably on my way to being fired or sent to the file room <laughs> <laughs> because I was just awful. And one of the gals said, you know, Universal Studios is doing a thing where they're picking girls for iron sides hmm. and they need, and they're looking for Chinese girls. And so I said, yeah, well, let's take off tomorrow from work and let's go. And I borrowed someone's coat so it would look ni I would look nice. And we went to Universal Studios Tour and there was a cattle call of about 150 Chinese girls hmm. standing there with the Ironsides producers and directors to pick the person that was going to be the daughter of the Chinese laundry people that he used to take his laundry to all the time. And I had never watched Iron Tide, so I had no idea about any of it. And for some reason, they chose me. And from then on, I worked for about a year and a half, all Universal Studios, anything they did, I did ad-living, I did extra work. I was a person they called to yell. For instance, on all of the medical shows, there was Emergency, Marcus Welby, there was a whole bunch of medical shows. And I would be chosen to be one of the people in the crowd that said, quick, call for the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and I then also was chosen as a teeny bopper to run after whoever star was. I would be one of the gals screaming, chasing the, the rock act. <laughs> <laughs> I did that for a year and a half. A resident yeller. Really? But I were the thing that I did because I'm so curious about everything. They would just hire me that day. A lot of people in the extras would be hired through central casting, and they would be on the phone calling constantly. I would go from stage to stage because I was so curious what was happening in, at the different stages, and I would start talking to people and finding out I, I didn't care who they were. They, if they looked like it was something they were doing was interesting. So I ended up talking to producers and directors, and I didn't know it. Hmm. So they would tell someone to get me on for a small bit for this, for that. And so I worked every single show at Universal Studios, even movies, every day. Then someone said that they were doing 222 and Love Boat at 20th Century Fox. And the person who was doing the makeup or something said, why don't you go and be in the classroom, one of the classroom people at 222? And I said, how do you do that? Do you want an extra? Do they want an actor? What What am I supposed to do? Somebody sent my name in and they called me and there I was on Fox. And at Fox, I was on that 222 a lot. 
as one of the kids in the classroom. Now, I was married and had a baby. <laughs> uh, and I played on Partridge Family. I was also a screamer yeller <laughs> because apparently that's in my resume. <laughs> <laughs> Under skill, skills, horseback riding, bowling, yelling. So that was stage 10. I was working and it was lunchtime. I took my brown paper bag to stage nine and I sat down at one of the benches, the picnic tables that they had there. And guess who was having lunch there? Gene Reynolds and David Hawks and Lenny, the second assistant director, were sitting talking and Jean was having lunch, and I sat down and said, mind if I join you? <laughs> I started having lunch. I had lunch with, with and, he, and he said, do you come here for lunch all the time? And he started talking to me, and he said to David Hawks, you know, we, we really need her. <laughs> David said to Lenny, get her number, get her things, and let's, let's have her come on the set. Wow. That was it. That was it. So if you had sat at a different table to eat lunch that day. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had so many friends around that lot by that time because I used to go to the nurse's station. Everybody used to talk. You can get free vitamins at the nurse's station. So I'd go to the nurses. I started talking to them. And by the time I was on the show, everyone on that lot knew me and I knew them. Yeah. My life is serendipity. It was never planned. None of it was planned. It was just being there. It's like a, a Forrest Gump. You, you were always in the moment. You know, you were always present. And that's where people respond to and resonate with. Yeah. That's why you were so, you know, interesting and, and uh, available because you were right there. You weren't you didn't have an agenda, really. You were just being who you were. I didn't have an agenda. And I was so fascinated and interested in everything everybody said or did. Mm -hmm. I thought everybody was fascinating. Mm -hmm. I still do. And I cared deeply about them and I cared that people were treated well and cared for and not ignored. Even young actors that used to come on our, our stage who had worked really hard being actors and had gone through agents and got a part and they were shaking, nervous. And so you just wanted to sit down and talk to them. Mm -hmm. It was about caring about people being interested in people. Mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't have mattered what kind of a career I would have ended up in. I think I, I wouldn't have been any different. You, you're that way too, Jeff. You're so interested in people. You you sit and talk and want to hear their story. I do. Yeah, I always have. And that's when suddenly uh, the second day I got, uh, you know, came back to MASH. Yeah. I suddenly was real interested in what was going on. And that's what, you know, again, that's what kind of kept me there too, uh, out of the, the curiosity. And then I became fascinated by everybody <laughs> yeah. and what they were doing, just like you say. Yeah, you just become fascinated, yeah. want to know what yeah. everybody's doing and who you are and what's happening and how you do what you the do. The stand-ins, the extras, the uh, Jeff and my favorite, dearest friends, uh, Roy Goldman, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, the, who nobody made anybody laugh more than Roy Goldman ever. ever. He was brilliantly funny. But he had stage fright like crazy. So he was, let's see, he was Gary Stanton, wasn't he? Yeah. And they would give him parts to do, like in the bar. And he, he, they'd say, okay, now, Roy, you just have to say, set him up and give this guy his whiskey. And they would film it. And the, the whiskey would be flying out of the, the glass. And he would go, yeah, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had. <laughs> Had he not had stage fright, he'd be a major, he would <laughs> major, be a major star. star. He was the he would, funniest yeah. little guy. He was. The most darling person I'd ever met. Everybody loved him. Yeah. You, you, there, there wasn't a time when you, that something wasn't going on on that thing that you couldn't plug in on and just sit and listen and go and have stories from anybody. It was just, we, and we lasted so long. I can tell you everything there is to know, but everybody, even our, I bet you don't even know our craft services guy, Jeff. Oh. He was so funny and he was so terrible. He got everything wrong. His name was David and he was someone's nephew. And he got to put food off. 
<laughs> uh, craft services, in case anybody doesn't know, that's a, a, a section of the stage where they have food and stuff. You go and get your coffee or your apples or whatever they put out. But they're responsible for putting out stuff to uh, satisfy everybody, the crew and the actors and whatever, just to go over and get an apple or a candy bar or something. But he wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> he was terrible. And Loretta Swift ate health food and she would go by and there would be 8,000 chocolate cookies and no water, and it would just be horrible. And she would get by, go by and she said, can't anybody put anything on here that, that that's healthy? And the next day, there was a bundle of uncut broccoli, like in a pile. Like... <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't being he wasn't being a smart Alec. No. He thought, well, she wants vegetables. I'm going to bring and, and then like a cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> Every single person on that set was precious. Kelly, when you hear from MASH fans, what are the comments and questions you get the most? Why didn't they? Why don't they use you more? Why aren't they using you more? And Alan says he always kicks himself that he didn't because they said they said they they were going to they were going to do a, a bigger thing. Hmm. I, gosh, I have to ask Alan why didn't they? But it was really Alan and Karen Hall wrote the sh that show. He looked me over for me. Yes, and they were keeping it a secret. I didn't know about it, and Alan was going to direct it, and it was absolutely fabulous to do, and um. I always, the questions I get is, why did they treat your nurse, Nurse Kelly, different than they treated some of the other nurses? Hmm. And why did Alan write that thing for you? And I said, Alan, I think what he did was he watched me over the years and he actually wrote the me that was actually me. Cause that's what I used to do. I would stand on the sidelines and tap dance. I try, I've always tried to learn how to t badly tap dance in the, in the wing. I, I was shocked because he actually wrote me. He wrote my personality into the character. And um, they asked me why he didn't write me as a different kind of a character. I said, I think he always treated me. I, I, I kind of refer it to like my fair lady. When, she, when, when Eliza Doolittle says he always saw me as a lady. So he always treated me like a lady. And to Colonel, what's his name? Colonel Pickering. Yes. You always saw me. As a servant girl, so you treated me like a servant girl. Well, I think the cast, the directors, the writers, and Alan saw me as a member of their team, always positive, always ready to go, always with a positive attitude, because I think they saw me, Kelly, like that on stage. And they saw me that way, and they, and so they wrote me like that. Yeah. They actually captured, I think, the essence of who I am. Now, my grandsons might differ, but I don't. Think so. <laughs> <laughs> what do you What do you think people should know about Mash? Oh gosh, I wish you had told me you were going to ask me that question. I would have written the book. <laughs> you should write a book. You still can. <laughs> it really was a show about compassion, and it was a show about dedication. And it was a show about humanity. And it was a show about being human within yourself while you are in dire straits. And we are all exactly like that. The, the joy of living is a blessing. And within that blessing, you have to str struggle through some things that may not be great, but that's how you're going to get through. And laughter, laughter is the key, you know. I am Hawaiian and you cannot go to Hawaii without not learning to laugh because people laugh at themselves. They laugh at each other. They laugh at other people. It's just a joy to laugh at people and know that you're all in the same boat. <laughs> it's okay. You know? Yeah. You're laughing at yourself too. And it's good. It's okay. And I think that's what MASH struck a note with everybody who watched it. Any one of them who had been forced to be in a situation like that in war, I trust that every human being eventually will come together, come together in, in the loving way. And if you do that, 
you will survive. And if you do that, you will overcome the, the struggle. So for me, it's a very, very important part of being human. It's too bad you can't express yourself very well, Kelly, because had you been able to, <laughs> you'd have done a lot of stuff. Man, I can't wait to read your book. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. That was beautiful. Yes, it was. Are you surprised, Kelly, by the, uh, the longevity of MASH that it still endures and is popular today as it was back when it was on the air? It's shocking. It's shocking. It blows me away. I would never have been able to conceive that this would go beyond five years of people remembering what it was. And what Jeff will tell you, the the same thing, that as we go through things in history, we are asked questions as people who have possibly lived through something when we did math, as though that was a historical thing that we had gotten through. And now what is our opinion of what's happening now? We have young viewers, teenagers who are writing fan mail as first watchers. We make sure to send them an early picture. <laughs> <laughs> they think it's just it's still on. Uh. It's amazing the generations that have watched Mash, and what they're doing a lot is they're 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 streaming it, mm-hmm. and we're we're hearing from them about all of their the favorite episodes, and they're very very kind, very amazing. But it's amazing. It's amazing you're having this podcast and that anybody out there is listening. It's just amazing. Well, that's the, that's the thing. Nobody is listening, so it doesn't matter what we talk about. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. We can talk about a supermarket. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but we have our memories, right, Jeff? Oh, it's we have really our memories. Oh, Kelly, we got, we got, uh, um, uh, for me, it's nine years worth of memories. But uh, I, you know, I, I've said this to Ryan a hundred million times, and I think I've said it on the podcast a hundred million times about the fact that Ryan is a fan of the show, was a fan of the show. And so many other people are fans of the show. I personally, I didn't grow up watching the show. I grew up with a job. MASH to me was yeah. a job. It, I wasn't a fan. I didn't hate it, but I, I wasn't a fan person for yeah. the show. Yeah. I loved everybody on the set. I loved yeah. you. I loved all yeah. the people. But it wasn't a show for me. It was it was a job. Yeah. So I don't have the same emotional connection to MASH as a television show that Ryan does and a lot of fans do. Do you have that kind of feeling as well? I mean, was it I mean, because it was a job. We were we were paid for it. We weren't doing it out of (laughs) of total, you know, love. Uh, We were paid for it. But so it was a job. But I you know, we love the people. We loved each other. I, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, I, I don't watch it a lot. It was my life. I had my life at home and then I would, I, I was there every day. I have a, a joyous life that if it hadn't been for the husband I have and the children that I have and David, I, when we first started the show, we had one car. We had a Volkswagen and a, Belgian Shepherd and two babies. And David would get up at five in the morning, one car, and he would drive me to the studio, which was an hour's drive. He would take the kids back. He would feed them their breakfast. He would take them to our Mima, our babysitter, who was godson. He was a teacher. He was then at three. He would pick them up. He would bathe them, feed them, put them to sleep, and then keep food warm for me in the oven the neighbor would come and sit with the kids so they're in bed. David would drive back to the studio to pick me up and bring me home and give me dinner. And the next morning we'd do the next, the same thing again. And he did this for years until we got two cars and then I got to drive on the lot. And not once in all of these years has that man ever complained about doing any of the things that he did. The the thing is, so I was at that set every single day. So when I get to watch it now, the things I see, Jeff, are being at work. Yep. The, it, it's 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 really incredible. Yep. It's like you have a visual of eleven years of your life and your people and things that happen, and it strikes up all these new memories mm-hmm. of oh, I remember when that that happened, when so and so that happened, when Max stopped the 
taping and he got up on the table and he started to do a whole McLean Stevenson started to do a whole routine and a tap dance in the middle and Larry Gelbart was laughing and falling down and they uh, the unit manager would come down and they would all stand around like, can't you people get back to work? <laughs> <laughs> and we were having so much fun telling jokes. And I remember that day. So my thing, it is like having a virtual video. Yeah. Yeah. Of every day of my life during that period. Yes. Yeah, reminders of, uh, of the moments. Yeah. And that's what I see when you see the show in a, uh, in a different context, with, some, with other people watching with you, then you see what they see. And at that point, I see how adorable I am. And I just said, <laughs> <laughs> if you do say so yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that with humility and all humbleness. <laughs> but you are. <laughs> you always have been. Mark Evans, the unit production manager, that was the guy that oh, you talked to. Mark Evans, Evans, kind of a thin guy, an English guy, had a funny little mustache. When is she wore that blazer, and he almost wore a cravat. Everybody hated him. He <laughs> he was nasty and snotty and snide. Oh, he was so mean. He was awful. And you know, do you remember he, he used to ride a bicycle around the lot? Yes. And one day, and we all used to walk from the set if we were going to go to the commissary, you know, five, six, nine of us would walk there. It looks like a green float, you know, walking to the commissary. <laughs> and one day, I don't remember exactly who did it, but somehow we arranged to have his bicycle run over. <laughs> and so we, we got him, we got a truck guy to run over the bicycle oh. and then put it back in the rack so that when he came oh, wow. out, I remember that. It was all oh my God, that was fun. That was a that was great, great, great oh. fun. And there were like six of us and you know, no, nobody could pin it on any one person. Oh, we no, all no. did. And there was like an investigation. Yeah. <laughs> He was he was mean to the very end when the last day we shot. Oh, he was terrible. The last day we shot, he came out with his British morning suit, looked like with the cravat, <laughs> tried to scatter away the three thousand press from around the world. Kelly, I'm glad you brought up the taping of the last episode because I'd love to talk to you. Uh, just your memories about the frenzy oh, God. during the filming and the airing of the finale. It was a zoo. It was the craziest thing I had ever seen before and the craziest thing since. You could take five parades from New York with all of their horses to the Gay Pride Parade in New Orleans during Mardi Gras and you wouldn't have as many crazy people outside the, the set, let alone inside the set. It was chaos and it was astonishing. I think that the, some of the crew and cast and uh, some of the extras and some of us, Jeff, did you do the march from the lunchroom all the way down the street with press chasing us at one point? Uh, I, unfortunately, for a number of reasons, <laughs> I wasn't there that last, last day. <laughs> I was there the day before. But the very oh. last day, I was not there, so I did not get the benefit of having that experience. But I, well, it was crazy for the week. Yeah, it was terrible. Yeah, everybody was crying and hugging and doing all kinds of things. Yeah, that was before the crest got there, it was it was it was very crazy. Yeah, because people had their families there, and so Alan's family was there. All of the cast family were there. And we had our family there, and people who had worked on it forever were invited. But the day before. Jeff, when you were there, it was crazy. And the day after, it was a mob. And we were chased by hundreds and hundreds of press who hadn't been let into the stage yet. They were on roofs, hanging out windows. And uh, G.W. Bailey, uh, I remember walking by. He was walking with me. We were being chased. And uh, some other people, G.W. says it was me, but I, I promise you it wasn't. We're on their knees yelling, I just want a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't get that that mob. I, I mean, I've been chased by mobs, but it wasn't didn't have anything to do with MASH. So, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, 
I have a question about I, I'm going to throw some things at you and just answer off the top of your head. This is, sounds like one of those goofy things they do on a TV show, but oh, well, I'm just going to give you names or words and just give me a quick word or sentence of, of what you think about the various people I bring up. I think that would be kind of interesting and fun. OK. Gary Berghoff. Oh, he is the sweetest, kind hardest person that has feelings that he wears on, on, on his sleeve, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? And I think McLean Stevenson was one of his mentors. And I think when McLean left and the way that they, the, the way they, that he left, I think really took a toll on Gary as very bad. And I think, he, I think he also wanted, I don't know, you have to interview him, but I think he wanted Radar to grow more. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that they, that they felt, I don't know what they felt, but I don't think it was in the nature of the pod of the way the personalities were on the show, that it wasn't a show that was going to grow that way. It was going to grow many other ways. But who we were as characters, Igor wasn't going to go suddenly be the hero, except he was going to be, he would have been a great hero by mistake. That would have been a good show. <laughs> that would have been a good show. Right? We should have. We should have written that. Yeah, that would have been good. <laughs> What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? you <laughs> okay, another name then. You mentioned him. My uh, McLean Stevenson. Oh, my God. The funniest man that ever walked the face of the earth. I don't think I ever had a day with him where there wasn't some part of that day where I wasn't on the floor. Other than Jeff Maxwell, I don't think there's a funnier man on earth. How much do you pay her, Jeff? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> Funniest off the cuff comedian that 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 I know, and 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 I miss him so much. Yeah, I was just shocked to lose him, and it was it you know they do a scene and they say cut, and then he'd do an eleven minute riff on oh something and God. just go off, and everybody's on the floor, and you go, wait a minute, aren't you oh. supposed to shoot the scene again? Uh. And nobody, it was really he was something. It was so good. Sometimes we had to cancel and start the next day because nobody wanted it to stop. Yeah. He nobody was. except Mark. <laughs> yeah, except Mark Evans. <laughs> oh, will you please stop? Shut up already and shoot the scene. <laughs> you know, and it's too bad. I don't think people really knew that about him. I mean, we all laughed at him as the character, but you didn't really understand how funny a guy he was. Really, was really amazing. funny. Yeah, he was. Really all right. Funny. Another name. Yeah. Larry Linville. Oh, Larry Linville. Larry was a gentle, sweet soul. And Larry Linville was a great guy, very talented. I, I, I think he was thrilled to be doing a series that made him money, that gave him some security. And I'm sorry he passed so young. But uh, I think this was a perfect kind of character for him to play. And I think he was a little insecure going into other things. Really, you shouldn't ask me questions, Jeff, because I can't help but be truthful. This is really what I think. Gee, no, please lie your brains out. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I really, no, I, I, I really, tr- I, I try to, but I can't. I, I, I have to tell you what I really think about these people. <laughs> well, Larry, you know what? One of the things that I remember about Larry, not only for being such a nice, sweet, just a wonderful person, he had a lot of girlfriends. <laughs> I, I, oh, that's what you want to talk about. I, no, no, no. Yeah. I mean, I kind of, I don't know why I kind of remember that he was married and then all of a sudden he was married to somebody else. And then a year later he was married to somebody. That was my impression. I thought, wow, this guy is, he gets around. Well, Maybe I'm wrong. You but like it, that, Jeff? Well, I mean, it was amusing. I, I was. You like that? <laughs> I thought it was an interesting character trait. No, no. He loved hanging around with the nurses. <laughs> He loved yeah. women. Yes, he did. He, you brought it out. He wasn't a he wasn't a slime. No, 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 no. He wasn't slimy. He was just cute. Yeah, he was. Mm. He was. And I don't think he ever got another good chance like this in another show. And I think that they tried to put him in stuff, but I don't think they ever tapped into what he could do. No, I don't either. I I, I really yeah. don't. I think it's hard when you establish such a character mm-hmm. that they did all of them. I think it. It would have been hard for them to go into another sitcom yeah. unless it was their kind of humor where they just did the same thing again. Yeah. I think it was hard for for them to establish a completely different role. To the people who do are pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Loretta Swit. Oh, Loretta Swit is my dear, dear friend. She was it. She was perfect. And she, I think, was also, this was her big series too. And, uh, 
I think the issue is that people always will identify with Loretta as Hotlet forever and ever. And I think she's a terrific actress. And I think that that's uh, sometimes that's a hard one to reestablish that you're not watching Hotlet. You know, she's also a terrific artist. So, yeah. Which we're going to get to about you, as a matter of fact, in a couple of seconds here. Well, what do you think about Loretta Swift? Oh, my gosh. I, I love her dearly. She's a she's an amazing actress. Because she loves you. I know that for a fact. <laughs> I don't get a letter from Loretta Swift, my dear friend Loretta Swift, without her mentioning Jeffy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. She's... She's a wonderful person. I think she's a fantastic actor. Uh, and it's, it, you know, when you're in a show that was as successful as MASH and in a character that it was as successful and iconic as Hot Lips, uh, it's very hard to kind of all of a sudden go in and do something else. It is. It's difficult because the so public is just so, you know, it's the it, public doesn't want you to. Yeah. Kind of in a way they don't want you to be other than that than that character of the Hot yeah, Lips. What yeah. the heck? Yeah. All right, Wayne Rogers. Let's go to Wayne Rogers. Oh, what about a character? Wayne Rogers had 18 businesses <laughs> at least going at the same time as he was doing that. And he would stand outside at the payphone with the extras who were calling in to see what their next day's gig was going to be, standing in line to call his broker. <laughs> <laughs> this is before cell phones. That was Wayne Rogers. He's a businessman. I used to just hang out next to him to see if I could learn something. You know, what's he buying? What's he doing? Because <laughs> he was amazing. He was a huge loss. He's an amazing businessman and a really nice fellow. All right. That tall fella, that other tall fellow, Mike Farrell. Oh, my sweet, 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 sweet Mike. Mike is my angel. Mike and Jeff and Alan. Mike called me almost every day. While I was going through cancer, so that Loretta called me all the time. Everybody in the cast, they they just honed in on me and said, "You're not going anywhere by yourself." Every one of them, and Mike, he's always been the kindest man on earth. I'll tell you one small story about Mike that nobody knows. I have several stories, but I'll tell you the one that I don't think he would mind if I told you. There was a extra who worked a lot on the show who was having financial difficulty we were on the stage so much with each other all of us that we knew about each other and mike said is everybody doing okay because it was coming to christmas time i said i don't think so and so is going to be able to afford much for his kids i said i'm thinking of doing something but i don't want to humiliate him or have him feel bad so i think i'll just do something for the kids and i later i found out that when that person opened the door on Christmas Day, there was a tree covered with presents, all kinds of things for the kids, and no card. Hmm. And I know who it is because he asked where where that person lived. And I thought he was just going to drop him a Christmas card or something. Yeah, that's Mike. He's a wonderful man. And tall. And so <laughs> tall and so handsome. He's very tall. If he falls down, he's going to be out of town, I'm telling you. But anyway. <laughs> Not my kid, that wasn't you. Don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> it was Morty Greensburg, actually, that did. <laughs> nothing, nothing to do with it. Okay, Alan Alda. Oh, you know I have to love Alan the best. How could you be around someone so brilliant for 11 years? But I just had 11 years of Einstein in the same room as someone that's that brilliant. One of the most brilliant people I've ever met. Now, he did like to do a take or two over and over and over again because he was also a perfectionist. But everything that came out came out like gold. Just amazing. Yeah, it was uh, it was quite an experience. What about what about Alan for you? You stood in for him and then you acted for him and then he he took your character to the next level. And I used to clean his house and uh, clean the pool and <laughs> wash his car, shine his shoes. <laughs> Come on, Jeff, get out of there. Go, clean the car already. Okay, Alan, I will. He loved Igor. He loved the character, Igor. Well, he, uh, yeah, I mean, she, I, I, you know, again, goes back to my feelings when I first got to MASH. I didn't know any of the actors, and I could have cared less. I didn't like actors. I thought actors were goofballs. Yeah. And so 
when I got there, I didn't care. And then little by little, I suddenly realized how good everybody was and how smart everybody was. And what an amazing experience I better pay attention to. Otherwise, I was going to blow it. Yeah. So I started watching and really locked on to Alan. And I went, this guy's really good. <laughs> I kind of knew something about acting before I got there. But I, I asked him, I said, Alan, I've been in nightclubs for a long time. And I said, I love to, you know, can you recommend an acting teacher? Because uh, I'd like to do that. Uh huh. So he did. He said, well, here's this woman. And I think I've said this on the podcast before. Forgive me, everybody, if I've said this. But he said, there's only one teacher that I know of that's worth anything. And she's in New York. But if she ever comes out here, go to her. Everybody else, forget about it. Wow. I said, what's her name? And her name is Viola Spolin. Oh, yeah. So two weeks after he said that, there was an ad in Variety saying, Viola Spolin coming from New York to open up her new class out in Los Angeles. So I ran as fast as I could. <laughs> And, you know, I had to go talk to her and jump through some hoops. But she finally said, yeah, OK, you're part of the deal. And I did that. I was with her for a number of years. And then her protege kind of took it over. And I was with him for a number of years just because it was such a healthy, fun, exciting thing to do. So I went back to Alan and I he didn't actually know it. He ended up, you know, we used to do a radio show some years ago and Alan did come on the show. And I told him that story. He said, I didn't know that. <laughs> I never knew you went there. <laughs> no, no kidding. Well, that was pretty good. I said, yeah, thank you, Al. It was a really good experience. It's so funny. Yeah, he was he was terrific. I mean, you know, what are you going to say about a guy who was at, on that set every day yeah. from, you know, six in the morning until yeah. seven, eight o'clock at night every day yeah. kind of carrying the show and doing the, the scenes and writing and directing. And he was gentle and kind oh, and nice and yeah. never, never lousy director screaming at anybody. Never, never, ever. Never. And he wrote, hey, look me over with Karen Hall because he wanted me to be a character that was always showing up and that they gave grounding to the show. He told me. But by the time he decided that, they decided to stop the show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're going to be a major character, Keller, but the show's over. So. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I always thought, and I've thought about this before, and I've said this before, because people said, what do you, you've been on other movie sets, and I've been on a lot, and what do you think of your experience with math? I think I'll just ask myself a question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. You, you go right ahead. Ryan, is that allowed? Can she do that? <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go take a break. Yeah. Yeah, you go ahead. I'm going to the toy. Yeah. <laughs> Lock up when you're through, Kelly, will you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the thing is, throughout this time, I realized being on other shows than a lot of other movies is that these were all people that were basically from theater. They were all theatrical actors. They were very much into the acting part of theater. They They, they weren't hired for uh, being a big movie star. They weren't hired for having had a great show. They were hired because Larry Gelhart was a theater man. And they brought a theater atmosphere, in my opinion, to the entire setup of the stage, the way we interacted with each other, all the way from the crew to the extras, to the mini mash, to the guest stars. They treated everyone like they would at a theater. They didn't all disappear for hours at a time to their dressing rooms to do their publicity stuff. They hung out a lot with everyone else. They hung out with each other. They played chess. They played poker. They played games. They, McLean would have held jokes. Harry sat around and told jokes. Larry Linville would play cards with them. Wayne Rogers would stand outside with the extra waiting for his turn at the phone. It was almost like a theatrical experience where you're putting on a show and you're forced to be together for long hours and you learn about each other and you love each other and you learn to love each other and you relate to each other. And our stage was set up like a compound. We had people napping. We had crew members taking 40 winks in the middle of the day with Mike Farrell on the other cot. And that's what I think was a key to those people being leads, giving us that environment to be much more involved. You know, and I don't I think a lot of people who uh, uh, the cast and pretty much everybody who was there 
was confident enough in themselves and their own abilities and their own talents to be secure and not to be threatened by things that might happen that other actors might be threatened. Yeah. Look, you know, show business is show. MASH was a business. It was a product. Yes. You know, it wasn't a church. No. It was a product. And people were there to make money one way or the other. The studio was there to make money. The network was making money. And everybody that worked there every single day was making as much money as they could possibly make. And actors live a life that is very insecure. And so everybody wants that job like you made the joke out. Uh, Gee, we want to keep working. And so there is a certain amount of insecurity about it. But... Everybody there had their own kind of inner security that they weren't so threatened that they had to be nasty and mean and stupid and awful like a like a lot of places go. Because, right. you know, insecurity is the thing that really generates all that all that awful pain and nasty attitude. So right. these people weren't these were so they could be secure and everybody could be friendly. And, and that's what I think was such a, you know, a big gift, you know, of the show. And, you know, there were days where you go, eh, gee, I wish this was happening this way or that was happening, you know, the other way. Yeah. But over the, you know, over my nine years, I never had a major horrible thing that I thought was terrible or anybody did yeah. something or said something. It, it just didn't happen. We were all kind of there. It and didn't happen. We got lucky. Yeah. <laughs> we really did. Yeah, got, we really very got lucky. lucky. And uh, just one last thing. When Darren and Alan wrote that one show for me, which I, I love that I have that, everybody, uh, except Mark Evans, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> well, he was home fixing his bike, so he couldn't do anything. Everybody in the cast, every director, every director who'd ever worked on that sent me bouquets and bouquets and bouquets of roses. They came to my home. They went to my dressing room. They were covered with them. Larry Gelbart brought out a huge bouquet with a cake to celebrate the fact that I had that role and they were happy for me. Yeah. That was something else. Yep. I thought, well, I wish this would continue. It didn't. It stopped right there. It stopped right there. I was... <laughs> <laughs> not another rose, but that was amazing. Well, it was amazing, and but it, again, it's a testament testament to all of the people who were adults and grown ups. And I kind of think yeah. that uh, I mean I've said this before too, but I I got to the show, and when I said, "Oh gosh, this is going to be a TV show," and I was hoping it was going to be filled with you know a bunch of wildness and craziness. And it wasn't. I was kind of disappointed. But then I realized that everybody was an adult. Yeah. And I had to kind of grow up and be an adult as well and, and learn yeah. how to be an adult. And I did. I, it was yeah. a family. And it was I learned as much in that family as I did in kind of my own my other family who were all in prison. <laughs> So it was uh, helpful. You were wonderful. Yeah, well, thank you. It was a, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience all the way around. Before we go, yes. and we do eventually have to go, I've had to go for the last <laughs> half hour, but I want you to know, <laughs> you are not only a, a, a wonderful actress and a wonderful person, but you happen to be a really incredibly talented artist. Oh. You are. My gosh, you are an amazing artist. I, I, I'd like, you know, to have you talk a little bit about that. I mean, you do it every day. Are you doing it now or can you or where where are you with with all that artwork? Well, I, I used to sketch on the set and I used to do facial portraits of anybody who wanted to. Usually they were the patients who were hired as day actors and had to be on the cot for eight hours as a patient. And so they had no say in the thing. And I would sketch them. I thought you asking nudity to be part of that was a little out of line. But (laughs) If they were smart, they would have held on to that sketch instead of throwing them out the minute they left the doors. I'm sure that they just threw them away, threw them in the ash can. They they could have had a, a magnificent piece. Uh, no, but that was my ambition. I was going to be an artist. Well, you are. <laughs> well, I wanted to go to New York and everything. And I, I met David. I, I started MASH. And so I painted my walls instead. No, seriously, literally, I painted a picture uh, in the bathroom and people came and talked to David about it once uh, uh, of um, who was it? Who is the director? Uh, Arto Peminger. Uh, I painted a picture of a uh, nude Otto Berlinger all over <laughs> the bathroom wall. <laughs> oh, 
I didn't know about this. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I, I just thought, well, I, it's a canvas. I'm going to do auto premise. A nude auto premise. Do you still have that painting? I want it for eBay. Put that and thing on eBay. It was eBay. on the wall of the bathroom. We sold the bed. We sold that little <laughs> cottage, which, by the way, it just sold last month for $1,100,000. Wow. So we should have kept the house and we should have kept the painting. Well, so if people want to see your painting, you have websites, a website? Yes, I, I have a, a website that has been off and on because of the website thing changing all the time. But it's called Kelly's, K-E-L-L-Y-E-S, Kelly's Art dot com. Apparently it needs work and we were just going to work on it before I I got diagnosed. So it's been a year. So we've got to go back to work. We will put a link to your website and your Facebook page also in our show notes for this episode. Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, I have a Facebook page. Yes, you do. That must be Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> you learn all kinds of things on this podcast. Wendy Anderson. She manages everything and she does an incredible job making sure I don't lose any fan mail and I don't lose anything. So everything that goes to Wendy comes to me. She's amazing. Well, she's amazing. Amazing, and you're amazing. I, uh, I mean, I can't tell you how joyous this has been for me, and I, I know Ryan will support the same thing. But I, not only is it fun because it's our podcast, and we're enjoying doing this more than we can say, uh, but to have you healthy and to sound as good and fun and upbeat and wonderful as you do is a is a real joy. So I am eternally grateful to whoever the heck makes that happen. It's you, Jeff. It's you. <laughs> it's me. I make it all happen. <laughs> it's all you. And Jeff, you're a genius. And I love you. And it's fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, everyone. It has been such a pleasure. I, it's been so much fun. And you just kind of lifted my spirits. I just I feel normal. Well, uh, Ryan and I have talked a lot about MASH. Ryan, I want, it was Ryan's idea to do this podcast and I kind of honed in on it and went, Oh, I'll do it with you, buddy. That's great. <laughs> and he, he graciously agreed to do that. I'm not sure why, but he did. Uh, but it be, it was because of his love of the show and his appreciation for everybody connected with it that this exists. Well, it's very cool. So thank you, Kelly, and be as well as you can be. I, I will be. I, I'm doing great, and thank you so much, and I'll talk to you guys later. I love you. I love you, too. We all love you. Ryan, do you love her? I do. I love you, too. Oh, good. Good. 